And as you can see, there are a lot of calvers in this aquarium. If you are interested in breeding them, I do have an in-depth species profile that you can watch here. You guys have not seen this tank in quite a while. G'day guys, Jason here. Welcome back to my fish room. So it's been quite a while since I've done a video. Uh, this is the first video of the year. Can't believe how quickly the year's gone by. And in this week's video, we're gonna be doing my full fish room tour for the year 2023. So let's get straight into it. And this is the first tank getting an update this year. My white Alto Lamprologus Calvus Fry Grout Aquarium. This is a five foot long aquarium and is actually one of the longest tanks I have in the fish room. And as you can see, there are a lot of calvus in this aquarium. Also have in this aquarium as part of the cleanup crew, some albino bristlenose catfish, the short fin variety. And some of those have grown quite large and are of obviously breeding size. Uh, I've been thinking of taking some of them out and putting them in other tanks and uh, breeding off those larger pairs. But uh, the main fish in this tank are obviously the white Atalampologus calvus. So these guys are pushing the two year mark. A uh, very slow growing fish, a uh, very slow growing cichlid from Lake Tanganyika in Africa. And uh, they're not that easy to breed, uh, but I've been very lucky with the breeding pair that I've got and I've had a lot of success with them. Probably spawned them about uh, 12 or 13 times now. I've actually lost count. These are some of the largest ones that I have in stock at the moment. So I'm very, very happy with this tank. I love watching this aquarium. Um, obviously it's not aquascaped uh, properly and that's because I'm always catching fish out uh, of this aquarium uh, and selling them on. So uh, unfortunately this aquarium is an aquascape. I'd love to do it one day and see how nice this tank could look with all the calvus in this aquarium. I don't recommend that you keep this many calvus in an aquarium, even a five foot long aquarium, for a very long period of time. As I said, these guys get sold on, they get moved on, they only stay in here for a number of months and then they go. The numbers are always fluctuating in this aquarium because I'm always selling in bulk to uh, the wholesaler and to uh, fish stores in Sydney. I wouldn't recommend you guys do this uh, in your homes for a very long period of time because you will stunt the fish's growth, the fish will stop growing, uh, they'll be stunted and uh, they won't grow to their full potential in, uh, their, in their aquarium for you. So I don't really recommend you do that. And the other thing is I can kind of get away with this stocking level in the one aquarium because I run a sump system. With this aquarium, it's hooked up to another 21 aquariums in my fish room. So there is over 3,000 litres of water going through this aquarium on a daily basis, not just the water you see in this tank. So there's a very high turnover rate of water coming in from the entire over 3,000 litres of water in the fish room. And uh, that's another reason why I can get away with stocking this aquarium to this level for a short period of time, once again, uh, moving these fish on. Anyway, there you go, guys. My white Alto Lampologus Calvus Grow Out Tank. And the next tank getting an update is my five foot long Neo Lampologus Lupi Grow Out Aquarium. This tank sits directly underneath the Alto Lampologus Calvus Fry Tank you just saw. And uh, these guys are doing well in this aquarium as well. And the Neolampologus Lupi, they're a beautiful fish from Lake Tanganyika in Africa as well. If you are interested in breeding them, I do have an in-depth species profile that you can watch here. Uh, and that tells you everything you need to know about the species. A 20 minute long video, the most in-depth video on YouTube about how to breed these beautiful fish from Lake Tanganyika. And again, this tank is an aquascape like the previous aquarium. Uh, and that is because I'm always selling fish out of this tank. So basically I pull these rocks out when I want to catch fish, catch the fish, bag them up, and uh, take it to the fish shop or the wholesaler. So obviously being able to remove the rocks helps you catch the fish a lot quicker. And um, if you can catch the fish a lot quicker, you're not stressing them out as much. If you're gonna chase them around the rock work for ages, you're gonna stress them out a lot more. So moving out the rocks, even though that's quite a traumatic experience for the fish and then putting them back in, it's just saving you a lot of time from hunting around the, the, the rock work to catch the fish. Now, if this was a tank in my, in my home, uh, where I wanted to be on display, I would definitely aquascape these two aquariums because I think they would look epic with this amount of fish in them. But again, like the calvers, I wouldn't recommend you keep this many lay loopy in the one aquarium for any length of time. Uh, again, I'm able to get away with it because I run a sump system and they're not in here for a very long time, only a few months to grow out to a sellable size and then they're gone. Uh, that's why I'm able to kind of get away with it. And the other fish in this aquarium are the Gillidogromus regani. They are the striped looking fish you see there. And uh, they are the Zambia gold variety. I don't have many in this aquarium at the moment. Um, I've sold a lot of them. And the other fish, again, as part of the cleanup crew, are some albino bristlenose, the short fin variety. And like the calvus tank, there are a lot of big adults in here that I could breed off. 
but uh, they keep these tanks spick and span for me. The glass would be covered in out here in a few days if I didn't have those guys in the aquarium. So uh, if you plan on doing something like this and you want some assistance with the algae growth in your aquarium, I highly recommend you get some bristlenose catfish to help you keep that algae at bay, save you having to scrape off algae off all the glass work. But anyway guys, there's my Neon Lamp Prologus Leilupi Grout Aquarium. Now long term subscribers will recognize this tank because I show it a lot on my channel. But this tank houses my white Altolamprologus calvus breeding pair. All the fry you saw in the first aquarium in this fish room, these are the parents of those fry. They've been such a good pair of fish for me. I bought them at my cichlid club a number of years ago now. Uh, they were just sold as a pair, not as a breeding pair. I've never kept calvus before. I thought I'd bite the bullet and give it a go. And within about three months of owning this pair, they had spawned in that shell you see in the middle there. These guys love these shells. Those shells are called ton shells. I'll put it on the screen here so you've got the spelling. They are large enough and wide enough for the calvus to happily go in and out of that shell. They will not get stuck in these shells. I've got another batch of Altolamprologus calvus that breed in ton shells as well. I've never had a problem with the calvus in these particular shells. I have in the past had fish get stuck and die in shells. I'll put a picture of that shell up, but I've never had fish get caught in these shells. They're great for the calvus, they love them. And as you'll see in another tank, when they see this shell, they know what it's for. With my white calvus, I keep the shell with them because the male likes to hide in it. He's actually in the shell right now. He's kind of uh, scared because I'm in front of the tank and there's a big DSLR camera in front of the tank as well. Female is out, she's just underneath the caves in the back there. Now the female is actually half the size of the male is. The male in this, in this tank is quite large. Beautiful fish, beautiful white calvus. I love these guys. I love them so much, they're the logo of my YouTube channel. Calvus, one of the most stunning fish, not only in Lake Tanganyika in Africa, but probably the entire world. I uh, love their compressed body shape. Evolved to be a predator hunting fry between tight crevices in the rocks. The dots and the lines on their body uh, helps break up their outline when they're hunting their prey. It's just that compressed body and their massive mouth is just perfect for predation. When they open their mouth, their jaw is so large, it can draw water into the mouth and that draws further food, further prey into their mouth. They've got quite large teeth, but even though they are built for predation, they aren't a very aggressive fish. They're one of the peaceful fish, one of the more peaceful cichlids you can keep. And these guys are quite shy and and as you saw, you can keep them well together in uh, large numbers in the aquarium. But like I said before, don't do that in your home for a long period of time. I would recommend you put dither fish in with your Alto Lamprologus calvus when you first get them home because the calvus will be quite stressed if they're the only fish in the, in the aquarium. It takes them quite a while to coax them out into the open water. If they don't see fish in the aquarium, they think all the fish are hiding because there's like a bird of prey about waiting to pounce and eat some fish. So if they don't see fish in the open water, it makes them on edge and they'll tend to hide more. If you have some open water fish with your calvus or your compressor seps, both shy species of fish, put some fish in the aquarium in the open water, some guppies say. The calvus or the compressor seps will see the fish in the open water, indicating to the calvus that there's no predators about. The calvus will then feel more at ease to swim in the open water and you'll see them more. And that's how I got this breeding pair to spawn for the very first time. I actually had a couple female guppies in this aquarium. They would release fry throughout the day. The calvus would get very good live food and then the guppies played the other role of playing through the fish, making the calvus feel more comfortable, more at ease, that there's no predators about because they're seeing fish in the open water. That's how I got these guys to breed for the very first time. If you really want to breed them, guys, I re really recommend you do that. Get your guppies from a very safe source. Keep them for a few months before you do feed any live food to your fish, just to ensure they don't have any parasites, diseases, anything like that, because you will infect your fish, obviously. Very lucky, love these fish. Probably my most favorite fish in the entire fish room. Anyway, guys, on to the next tank. And the Leilupis you saw before, these are one of the breeding pairs that I have in the fish room that produce those fry. And as you can see in this aquarium, they've got fry again. And these, the fry that they have with them right now, this breeding pair, uh, just oh, about an inch long and they've already got bright yellow coloration. The breeding pairs that I have in my fish room are very high quality bloodline, the beautiful coloration and I brought four fish hoping to get at least one pair out of the four that I bought and it just so happens I ended up with two breeding pairs from the four that I bought from the aquarium shop. Uh, when I saw these fish for sale I had to buy them, I had to buy the adults because they're just stunning coloration and I knew their offspring would be as well and as you can see here the offspring at this size to have that coloration you know these guys 
have a lot of potential to be amazing Neil Emperor Logo Slay Loopy. Uh, ideally, I would have pulled these fry out of this aquarium and moved them into a grout tank. One of the reasons why I didn't do that is because I don't want to keep breeding the Lay Loopy at the rate that they could potentially breed at. Neil Emperor Logo Slay Loopy, uh, I've got two breeding pairs in this fish room, like I said. I can be getting batches of fry every fortnight, every two weeks and uh, that's just not sustainable. That's just way too many fry. They have about 200 to 250 fry in the one spawn, these guys. And again, I've got two breeding pairs. So imagine that many fry every two weeks. So I keep the fry in with the parents just to uh, slow the rate of spawning down. If they do spawn, which sometimes the parents do spawn with other fry in this aquarium, so be it. I have to let nature run its course. The new spawn gets eaten by the older fry that are in this aquarium. These guys get a good feed of nutritious eggs from their mother and life goes on. But uh, yeah, if I was to move these fry out of this aquarium into a new one, the breeding pair would spawn within approximately a fortnight and I'd have another 200 fry. So that's how I control uh, the rate of breeding with these guys. I just leave the fry in with the parents. Once the Leilupi you saw in the five foot aquarium all get sold out, these guys would go into that aquarium and they will grow out in there. And then that's when I would let the parents spawn and raise another batch of fry. So I've always got fry on the go at different rates of growth. So that's how I try to keep the fish room sustainable. Now in this tank, you can notice that there is algae on both sides of the aquarium. I do not keep bristlenose catfish in with this breeding pair of Leilupi because they are very aggressive. And if I was to do it, I'd probably put very large bristlenose in here so they could defend themselves, but that would be cruel because one, it would make the Leilupi a little bit stressed out because they'd be attacking or always attacking the bristlenose. And obviously it would be very stressing for the bristlenose getting it constantly attacked, not being able to hide from the breeding pair. So. That's one of the reasons why I don't put bristlenose catfish in with my Neal Emperor Logos Leilupi. The second reason is that the Leilupi feed off the algae. It actually benefits them to have some algae in the aquarium. Uh, you'll see them hugging the panes of glass, picking at whatever microorganisms are living in the algae and actually picking at the algae itself. So again, if you want to see how, what I recommend you do to keep uh, the coloration up on your Neal Emperor Logos Leilupi, I highly suggest, again, you watch that in-depth species profile on Neal Emperor Logos Leilupi. That's why I don't scrub the algae off the sides of the aquarium because it does benefit these guys. But there you go guys, my Neal Emperor Logos Leilupi breeding pair. Okay, so this aquarium houses my Emperor Logos Ocellatus Gold. Now, in my last video, I showed you guys how I got a breeding trio out of a group of six. And if you want to see that video, I suggest you watch it here. However, uh, the female, one of the females passed away Unfortunately, it just happened suddenly. I don't know if the male bashed her or not, uh, but she uh, died shortly after making that video. So that was quite ironic that that had happened. So I only have two Lampralogus Ocellatus Gold adults in this aquarium. However, they have been breeding frequently and the spawn sizes have grown. They've probably got about 50 fry in this aquarium right now, all at different ages, and they're doing quite well. You can see on the left of the aquarium, there's some holes that like, it look like holes in the sand, like here and here. They are actually shells that the female has buried in certain positions and she only almost cover the opening of the shell. Just enough space in there for her body to be able to fit into the shell. That keeps predators away. Really helps with protecting the fry from larger fish that won't be able to get in that little gap. Obviously if they wanted to barge in there they could but Lampralogus ocellatus gold are a very aggressive fish from Lake Tanganyika in Africa. Now you can see the female tending to the shell there. She, that's where she recently spawned and there are a lot of small fry at the opening of that shell and uh, she's been spawning in multiple escargo shells. This tank has a large footprint and it is quite large for Lampralogus ocellatus gold but I could probably get away with another female or two in this aquarium and the male would breed with all of them. So uh, my original breeding uh, group was a trio, one male and two females, and uh, he would spawn with both females like clockwork at the same time, and all the fry would mix together, and the females wouldn't eat each other's fry because the fry would mix together. Uh, and I was hoping to do the same with, the, with another breeding trio. So um, I'm really happy with the progress these guys have made over the last few months. Uh, the spawn sizes started with like one or two fry uh, every few days, and now we're seeing, geez, her, lar her largest spawn was the last one and I'm, I'm honestly guessing about 40 to 50 fry just from that spawn. So really pleased with that. Uh, these guys are really maturing up. Now, you might notice this tank doesn't look exactly clean on the gravel. Uh, on the right hand side of the tank, I have some cyanobacteria that I'm battling in this aquarium. Uh, this aquarium is on a sump system 
However, uh, this aquarium just for some reason has a little bit more of a cyanobacteria problem than the others. Lamprologus oscillatus gold do like to dig, uh, but they don't dig anywhere near as much as other shell dwellers from Lake Tanganyika, such as Multifasciatus, and the Lamprologus Multifasciatus. They probably dig the most out of all the shell dwellers uh, from the lake. Uh, and if I did have Multifasciatus in this aquarium, I'm pretty sure the amount of digging that they would do on a daily basis would just cover up all that cyanobacteria and not give it a chance to grow. But because the Lampologus oscillatus gold don't dig as much, gives a chance for the cyanobacteria to take hold. Uh, so I am trying to battle it and trying to win that battle uh, by having the lights off. I could treat with ChemiClean, but I'd need a lot because this tank is on a sump system. It's two foot wide by two foot long by 14 inches high, a nice wide footprint. I um, like to keep the smaller cichlids, the substrate spawners from Lake Tanganyika. So I got all these tanks made to my specifications for this fish room. And I like the very shallow uh, aquariums with a wide footprint. So these guys have a lot of room to swim in because they don't swim in open water. They like to hug the sand bed. Yeah, really happy with these guys and hoping to sell some of these fry in the next few months. And this is my Neolampologus Curiurus Aquarium. Now you guys have not seen this tank in quite a while. Some of you might be surprised to see what's swimming around in it. Uh, those little fish darting around. I have ended up with a breeding pair. So a little bit of a background story about these fish. Uh, if you're new to the channel, I won these uh, fish at a raffle from my cichlid club. And there were four in this aquarium. A pair eventually formed. Unfortunately, the ratio was the complete opposite of what you want. Uh, I had three males and one female. But fortunately, that a pair did form, and I took out the two excess males uh, because they were getting dominated by the male you see here on the left, and um, took them out, and uh, these guys started spawning in pretty large numbers. Uh, they're spawned three times now, and like the Lamprologus oscillatus gold, this most recent spawn is the largest spawn they've had. There's possibly 50 fry again in this aquarium of these beautiful shell dwellers from Lake Tanganyika in Africa. They do look like a Neolamprologus brevis sunspot, but they aren't. Neolamprologus brevis sunspot don't get anywhere as large as these guys do. And these guys have a forked tail. As you can see by the male, they're beautiful fins, almost like a brachiati. Uh, the, the brevis sunspot don't get that. Uh, but yeah, these guys really, really happy, really stoked that uh, I've got so many fry from, from them. Uh, so you can probably tell. I love shell dwellers, I love the substrate spawners of Lake Tanganyika and thankfully uh, these guys are, are doing really well for me. I've got a couple, uh, there's three generations of fry in this aquarium like I said and uh, they're, they're all co-inhabiting. I mean, I'm suspecting that uh, eventually the larger fry will start to pick off the smaller fry uh, out of this aquarium if I don't move the larger fry on and that's because I do have Neolamprologus brevis sunspot in this fish room and that's what happens with their fry the larger fry will pick off the younger ones, unfortunately, once they reach a certain size. So I will we'll have to start catching these fry out, putting them in grey out aquariums, and then selling them on. But yeah, you see, the shells in this tank are a lot larger than the Lamprologus oscillatus gold shells. And I'm not sure what these shells are called, sorry. But um, the reason why they are larger is because these fish do get quite large. The males get so large that eventually they won't fit into the female shells and have to spawn from outside the shell and then the female kind of brings his milt into the shell to fertilize her eggs. And like the last tank again, I've got a cyanobacteria problem in this aquarium. These guys do dig a little bit, uh, but again, not, that, not too much. And unfortunately, uh, that digging isn't enough to keep the cyanobacteria at bay. And it, it, it does, uh, it can get a hold in this aquarium. So in this tank, I've only been keeping the lights on for very short periods of time during the day to try and kill off that cyanobacteria. Unfortunately, like the Lamprologus oscillatus gold tank, I can't vacuum in this aquarium with um, a gravel vac because I'll end up sucking up the fry. The fry is so tiny and so well camouflaged against the sand bed, you don't notice them unless they're moving. And when they get scared, they stay still and they'll hug the sand bed. So <laughs> they're basically sitting ducks if you're using a gravel vac. So just let it be, live with it, so be it. There's some cyanobacteria in the tank. Unfortunately, it's in the tank. I'd like to get rid of it, but I'd rather have the fry survive. So it's not harming them. Um, and I'm just keeping the lights off and winning the battle that way. But yeah, these guys, outstanding. I really want to do an in-depth species profile on these guys soon and um, document that for you guys. 
because um, I'm really, really pleased with breeding a new species of fish in the fish room. I only bred them for the first time just around Christmas time, I believe, from memory. So yeah, it was a great way to bring in the new year with a brand new species of fish that I've never bred before in the fish room. But anyway, on to the next aquarium. So this is my other Neolamprologus Leilupi breeding pair. And I wanted to start off uh, showing you this tank from a wider angle so you could see the full aquarium from the front. Uh, basically because I wanted to show you how much sand they've banked up to the front of the aquarium. Uh, there are some rocks at the back of the tank, but you can't really see them with this angle because all the sand has been brought to the front of the aquarium. And like I said previously, all these tanks are 14 inches high and they've brought the sand almost halfway to the waterline, so almost six inches up. Uh, so they've done a lot of digging and I don't have any cyanobacteria problems in this aquarium. And uh, like my previous Neolamprologus Lupi Aquarium, I don't clean the sides of the tank for these guys because again, the algae and the microorganisms that may be living in that algae benefit the guys during the day. They're just always constantly picking at it. You can see them right now picking at it on the panes of glass. So leave it in there. It's not the cleanest looking aquarium, but the guys love it. So it benefits them greatly. Now, I bought this breeding pair, these two fish. At the same time, I brought the other two Leilupi. I just picked out four fish from an aquarium of about 40 Leilupi and tried to buy two males and two females and hope that when I get them home, in the next few months, I'll get a breeding pair out of, out of the four that I bought. Well, within 20 days, this is the pair that first spawned. Uh, they, they're the initial pair that I had uh, that formed in my fish room. And uh, within 20 days, that I had fry. It was unbelievable. I really didn't expect that to happen. I thought I'd be lucky to get a breeding pair out of them within the first six months of owning them. So to do it within 20 days, within a month, I was just stoked. Uh, this female does breed a lot more frequently than the previous female. She, she will breed with our fry in the aquarium. Uh, that doesn't worry her too much. She, she, sometimes she protects the younger fry from uh, the older generation of fry, but sometimes she doesn't. And again, I just let nature run its course, guys. You don't want to stress the fish out all the time. Uh, one, you'll be stressing out the fry at a very young age if you were to take them out every two weeks. And you could potentially kill your fry by doing that. They're too young to be moved out of the tank, I feel anyway. I definitely have experienced that with Calvus and Lamprologus oscillatus gold fry. It's best to just let them be for a number of weeks. And then once they're large enough, they're a little bit more hardy. Move them out into a great aquarium if you want your pair to spawn again. Uh, but just let nature run its course. Like I said, the spawn will benefit the older generation of fry. It's good nutritious food for them. And you won't be able to actually keep up with the amount of fry that your breeding pair would produce. Yeah, there you go, my Neolamprologus Leilupi breeding pair. The second breeding pair in the fish room, but the first pair to form. <laughs> so this is my Autolamprologus Black Calvus Aquarium and I actually have four of the fish in here. Now, this tank, it's not the greatest looking tank. I hate having terracotta pots in aquariums. I just don't like the look of them. That's just my personal preference. I prefer slate or natural looking boulders, something more natural uh, looking, not so much man-made, but these are good alternatives to shells just to provide the guys with some shelter. See the amount of digging these guys have done as well. Uh, there's a big pit in the middle there with a number of rocks. Uh, and sand all over them. They're quite secretive at the moment. Now the reason for that is I've had this tank covered because again I've had a cyanobacteria problem and I've been trying to clean that up. These guys have spawned in this aquarium a couple times. Uh, I have sometimes I've taken the fry out, sometimes I haven't gotten to the fry in time because there's four calvus in this aquarium. They've been preyed on by the other adults in the tank. I'm not really ready to breed them again. I do intend to move them out of this aquarium and into a different aquarium. What I really want to do is move these guys out of the aquarium and into the aquarium you saw the first breeding pair of Neolamprophyte Logos Leilupi. I want to move them into that tank uh, and that's purely because of the OCD in me because the tank that's next to them is the white Autolamprologus calvus. So I kind of want the calvus on the one side of the fish room and then what I do is move the other breeding pair of Leilupi into this tank. I have the two breeding pairs of Leilupi right next to each other with uh, some a, a divider so the Leilupi pairs can't see each other from the, between the tanks because that would just stress them both out. Uh, and then have the Leilupis together, have the shell dwellers in the middle, and then have the calvus down the end. And I think that would just put some order in the fish room. Again, don't really necessarily have to do that. The OCD in me really wants to do that. We'll get to it one day, and then once I do that, I'll look at um, breeding them again. Now, these guys love to breed in shells. Uh, they breed in ton shells, as you saw before, 
with my white calvus breeding pair. They breed in those ton shells. If I was to put a ton shell in here right now, I guarantee you guys within the week they will spawn. They know exactly what that's for. They love them. And uh, whenever I've done that with these black calvus, they've spawned uh, in a very quick time. Uh, it's always surprised me when I've done that. Uh, having the tank like this, they'll spawn, but it will be very, very infrequent. I've probably had the tank like this for about uh, six or seven, maybe even eight months, and they've spawned twice in here, maybe three times. If I had the ton shell in here, they'll probably spawn once a month. Uh, but I can't keep up with that much fry. As you saw, I've got a lot of calves fry in the fish room as it is, but um, I, it's nice to know I can control the rates of, of uh, spawning in the fish room just simply by placing a shell in the aquarium. Again, if you want to know more about them, I do have an in-depth species profile, one of the most popular videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch that video here and I discuss everything, all the trials and errors that I went through to successfully breed Alto Lampologus calvus. And that video can be used for compressor steps as well, Alto Lampologus compressor steps. You can use the tips and tricks that I've got in that video for compressor steps as well. But anyway guys, on to the next aquarium. And this is another Alto Lampologus calvus for I go out aquarium. But these calvus are the black variety. So these guys came from the black breeding pair that you saw before that have another two calvus with them uh, that I want to move into the other Leilupi Aquarium. So they're the parents and these guys, as you can see, are doing really, really well. Now, if you were to hazard a guess at what calvus these were before I told you, are they the black calvus or the white variety? And that's because the black calvus can go quite light, but this is one of the reasons why I tell you guys uh, a lot in my videos not to mix black calvus and white calvus together because they will crossbreed and you will not be able to tell them apart. I personally like the look of the black calvus more than white calvus. I think the white iridescent spots on calvus stand out a lot more. There are a lot more contrast. There's a lot more contrast on the black calvus than there is on the white calvus. Now again you can see there are some rocks in here. It's not beautifully aquascaped like I would like it to be, but that's because this four foot aquarium has become a grow out tank. Uh, and I move these rocks in and out of this tank all the time, put them back in, uh, just makes catching the fish a whole lot easier and it stresses them out a lot less as well. And now you can see also on either end of this aquarium, there are two shells, uh, one on each end. And that is because my excess male Kuriuris are in this tank as well. And those guys are gonna get sold off soon. This tank has bristlenose catfish in it. Uh, I find you can keep bristlenose catfish in with calvus because again, they're not as aggressive as other cichlids, say such as the Neolampologus leilupi. The bristlenose do help clean the tank, help clean the algae off the, off the glass and off the rocks. That's great because it helps me with my aquarium maintenance. And this is the other four foot long aquarium that I have in the fish room. It's four foot long by two foot wide by two foot high and uh, one of the larger tanks that I have in here. Now, this is pretty much the only uh, Tanganyikan, the only true Tanganyikan community aquarium I have in the fish room. There's a lot of different fish in here, and that's because I haven't gotten ready to breed all the different fish that are in here. So uh, these are kind of all the excess. Uh, the, the main fish in this aquarium are the first of Risha. They've grown quite large in here. There's two males and three females. I got very lucky with uh, the ratio with these fish. Probably the first time I've hit the jackpot with uh, the ratio uh, on some um, mouth brooding cichlids. And uh, I, I am looking to move on the excess male because there's constant fightings in this aquarium. And uh, it's actually on the smaller side for these guys. These guys need massive amounts of swimming space and even a four foot long by two foot wide by two foot high aquarium isn't enough. Ideally, this would be a six foot tank by two foot wide by two foot high. But I just don't have that in the fish room. Um, but the first of fur, they are the first of fur Risha, beautiful fish. You see the male, he's color, he colors up really nicely when he's in um, spawning condition, when he's ready to spawn with one of the females. I have spawned these guys a number of times over the last few months, but I unfortunately haven't successfully raised any of the fry. So the reason for that is, one, these are juvenile fish still. Uh, they're learning how to be uh, good mothers, these the females, and they eat the batches of fry, unfortunately. Uh, the other thing they've been doing is spitting the batches of fry out well before uh, they're ready to be free swimming. Um, I do have some egg tumblers in the fish room, 
and I do plan on using them for these fish because these fish are quite rare and they are on the expensive side and they are a beautiful fish, one of the most colourful fish from Lake Tanganyika. What I really should do is put the eggs in the egg tumbler the moment they um, spawn. But I like to try and teach the fish how to be good parents. I had a problem with the breeding pair of Leilupi you saw first in this video. The male with that pair would always eat the fry. The first five or six spawns, he would just keep eating the fry. And eventually he matured and his instinct must have kicked in. Now, imagine if I pulled those six batches of fry out, every time that pair of Leilupi spawned and I pull those fry out, that male's never gonna learn how to become a good parent and to become a good father to his fry. And he's always gonna be eating those fry. So as disheartening as it is to see your fry get eaten, I recommend you persist at it. Let them learn how to be good parents. Sometimes you just need to let nature take its course and uh, let the parents learn. And again, with the first of fur reacher, that's what I'm trying to accomplish with the females. Even though I know they're probably gonna spit those eggs out or eat the eggs, but I've been persisting with them. So hopefully they can learn how to hold the mouth brood full term to raise the fry. Because ultimately, the fry are gonna benefit from being raised by their mother more than me stressing out the female, trying to milk her of the eggs when she's only held them for a day. They're never gonna learn how to be a good mother. And hopefully, now I don't know if this is true, but maybe if the females learn how to be good mothers and hold their brood full term, then they might pass that instinct on to the next generation of fry. I don't know, again, I don't know if that's true, but that's something I've thought of with uh, mouth breeding cichlids that we have. Uh, maybe they're milked too early and they just don't pass on that, that instinct to the other generations of fry. And that's why I'm having problems with these, with these females. But uh, I'm gonna persist for a little bit longer and I might lose a little, some more batches of fry, unfortunately, but I really want the females to learn how to be good mothers. I want them to learn how to look after a mouth breed full term. Um, and again, hopefully pass on that, that instinct to the next generation of fry. But uh, the other fish in this aquarium, the other fish that I really want to spawn are the gold Alto Lamprologus compressorceps. These guys are the gold variety, not the gold head. The full body is gold. They're beautiful fish. And I actually have six in this aquarium. So my plan is to put them into one of the two foot aquariums you saw earlier, the two foot long by two foot wide by 14 inch deep aquariums. One of the aquariums that I have the breeding pairs of Le Lupis in and breeding them in there. Uh, try and get a pair out of the six that I've got. Uh, normally I wouldn't want to put six in an aquarium that small, but I think that would be fine until I get a breeding pair to form and then I take the excess out, leave the breeding pair to spawn, uh, let them be in the two foot aquarium and that would be fine for them. I do have one dominant male, this compressor seps, in this tank. Uh, the other four or five kind of hang out together with that dominant male is the grumpiest in this aquarium and, and the largest and the most intensely colored in this tank. I'd like them to spawn off him because his genetics I think would be great. Now the other fish that I have in here, I have two Neolamprologus corepunctatus. They're the fish with the high yellow dorsal fin, beautiful fish from Lake Tanganyika. Initially had three, I lost one in a transfer to this aquarium. It got too stressed out from all the fish in this tank and it passed away within the week of being in this tank. So I've only got two left unfortunately. Also in this aquarium, I've got one Neolamprologus similis. And again, unfortunately I lost the other one. Uh, I'm not sure why, it was in this aquarium for quite some time but it just uh, died one of those things. I just don't know why, just passed away. I found it dead one day. Um, but yeah, they were both males. I never spawned the similar side. I bought them as a pair, but they were uh, both males, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm looking for some similars again because I really want to breed those guys. Uh, there is also one Gilidochromus regani, a female. Uh, her male partner passed away in one of the tanks behind me on the rack that's opposite this rack. And uh, that was a sudden thing, I don't know why, again, that happened, but she's a lone female, and um, she's, she's in here by herself, unfortunately. She may have bashed the male, to be honest with you, I'm not too sure. Uh, the females in the Regani species are the dominant fish of the pair, and uh, females that are smaller than males can, can actually, they've got more aggression than the males, so much so that they will kill males that are larger than them. So uh, the females in the Regani world are the dominant fish. Uh, and the last fish I'll mention in here is one Neolamprologus Leilupi that is actually deformed and I never had the heart to put down. And I've just kept him because he's not hurting anyone, he's swimming around, he's okay. And um, he's living his life in this aquarium as best as he can. 
and uh, yeah, just a cute little fish. Um, I just didn't have the heart to put him down. Uh, so he's in this aquarium as well. But um, yeah, that's this tank. There's also, like I say in, with the other aquariums, cleanup crew in here, bristle nose catfish. Simple as that. I don't have to spend hours a week trying to scrape algae off all the panes of glass. Bristle nose do that for me. Makes the tank look very clean. Yeah, I don't have to break my back reaching into this tank trying to keep the glass clean. That's my only mixed Tanganyikan community aquarium. Now in 2022's full fish room tour for the year, I showed you every single tank on the top row. I'm not gonna do that this year because it was just very repetitive. Pretty much every tank had calvus in them and pretty much every tank now still has calvus fry in them. So I'm just gonna show you one tank uh, on the top row and uh, call it a day because the video can get very, very long and very repetitive. Uh, in this tank, we've got some black Alto Lamprologus calvus fry. Uh, I have to label the tanks because I will get them confused which fry have the white calvus and which fry have the black calvus. So these guys, the tank you're looking at has black calvus fry in it. The other fish in here are some Julidochromus regani that were too small to put in the five foot tank with the Leilupi. Uh, they could probably go in there now because they're growing quite large. They've caught up to the calvus and uh, pretty much grow, outgrown them. In this tank, you can see there's some rocks, no substrate uh, for ease of cleaning. And at the back, I have a double headed sponge filter. All the top row of tanks had double headed sponge filters in them. And that is because I intended when I set up the fish room to use these tanks as uh, quarantine aquariums. So even though this, the, all these tanks are run on a sump system, they're all connected up to each other. Now, if I wanted to cut off flow from any of these tanks uh, on, this, on this sump system, I just go to the back of the stand, turn the ball valve to shut off water from going into the tank, and then lower the water level below the bulkhead, which is at the top left of the back of the aquarium. The water can't come in and it can't go out of this tank. The tank then runs on the double-headed sponge filter in this aquarium. These, these sponge filters are always seeded. They've got beneficial bacteria in them already, so I don't have to cycle the tank. So if I was to buy new fish, they'd go into one of these aquariums for six weeks until I'm sure they don't have any parasites. So once that quarantine period is over, all I have to do is open the ball valve at the back of the aquarium, water starts to flow into the tank, it starts to fill the tank up, and then spills over the bulkhead back to the sump, and the circuit is, again, complete. Some of the aquariums on the top row do have substrate, and some of them don't. This tank with the calvus in it doesn't have any substrate in it, bare bottom. There's also a bristlenose catfish in here that again helps me maintain the cleanliness of the aquarium. Uh, so that's pretty much what all the tanks on the top row look like. Uh, they have calvus in them um, and a bristlenose catfish. So I'm not gonna bore you with it all. Uh, some of the tanks are empty. I don't have all the tanks stocked up and that's what you want in a fish room. You don't wanna have or your tank shock a block because the next batch of fry come along or you get a sick fish, you're not gonna be able to put it anywhere uh, to quarantine it off. You're not gonna be able to put that new batch of fry anywhere. So I always like to have some spare tanks in the fish room just in case of emergencies or in case of that sneaky purchase of a brand new fish that you uh, just bought. So uh, always handy to have some spare tanks in the fish room available for those sorts of things. Anyway, on to the next tank. Okay, so I may have told a white lie on the previous aquarium. This tank is next to the black calvus tank and it's nearly set up. It has some pull filter sand in it as well as some cut up PVC pipes. And it might not look like there's any fish in here at the moment. There's definitely no bristlenose catfish because of the state of the glass on the sides of the aquarium. But there are some fry in here. And these are the first batch of Lamprologus ocellatus gold fry that I have separated from the parents you saw earlier. So, there are three fry in this tank, <laughs> and they are some of the first fry that the Lamprologus pair had. They're still quite small, and Lamprologus ocellatus gold fry are some of those slow growers. And I'm hoping that the fry that I have with the breeding pair at the moment will be able to catch up in size soon, and I'll be able to put them in this tank. Uh, because Lamprologus ocellatus gold, if you haven't bred them, again, you can watch the video here on how to breed Lamprologus ocellatus gold and they're not that easy to breed. The fish are quite aggressive, and they are aggressive to their own fry. When the parents want to breed again, they will happily eat their older generation of fry. You're always having to constantly catch out the older generation of fry from the tank, and to minimize that stress, the grow out tank that I've got these fry in is just above the parents' tank, so it's very easy to transfer the fry from one tank to the other. Another benefit of having a sump system, all the water parameters are exactly the same. 
across all the tanks in the fish room and I don't have to do any acclimation of the fry or anything like that of the fish because they go from one tank to the other, all the same water parameters. There's no shells in this tank, even though these guys are shell dwelling cichlids from Lake Tanganyika in Africa. In the grow out aquariums, I don't like to keep shells with my shell dwellers because it makes it impossible to catch them when you need to sell them. It takes a lot longer to get the fish out of the shells short of breaking the shells open, which you don't want to do, obviously. So you put some PVC pipe in the aquarium gives the fish some shelter and also put some rocks in there that's okay for them as well and then when it comes time to catch the fish out you just take out all the pvc pipes no hiding places for them and you just catch them out bag them up and sell them off easy as that try to make your life simple and a lot less stressful for the fish onto the next tank and this tank has my neolamprologus brevis sunspot breeding trio in it and you see the amount of fry they've got in the foreground of this aquarium and again, the cut up PVC pipe at the front for the fry to hide in just to feel a little bit more at ease. Again, I don't like to give these guys too many shells when they're breeding purely because I want to be able to catch these fry out. Uh, and I need to do that soon. Some of these fry are growing quite large and they're actually starting to prey on the newer generations of fry that are being born from the shells. So I actually need to catch them out and put them in a grow out tank. Brevis fry are very hard to catch. They have a very, um, weird way of swimming which is very deceptive yeah it's it's not a fun experience and they love to jump when you're trying to get the net up near the water they like to get right there onto the edge of the net and try and jump off the net and it's it's just a nightmare brevis for some reason are just a crazy fish i don't know why they're like that but anyway in this tank like i said there's a breeding trio you got the male and two smaller females they're pretty much half his size and you can see the two shells that the females live in. Now the male lives with the female in the shell in the middle of the aquarium. He's always stayed with that female. Whenever the, he's scared or when he's gonna go to sleep, he'll go into that shell with that female. It's quite cute to see their behavior. Uh, whereas the other female is his second choice. Uh, but yeah, he, he spawns with both. Both females don't eat each other's spawns. Uh, all the fry mix as you can see here. And that's how you successfully raise um, fry from a breeding trio. The, the, again, the only thing that you really need to do is catch out the older fry. The smaller fry that you see in here won't prey on the uh, new generations of, of fry that are being born. Uh, they're just too small to prey on those fry. Uh, but the largest of the fry that you see here definitely will. Uh, the alternative is to just get the parents and move them into another tank and let these fry grow out in this aquarium. Um, I've done that before. I've moved the parents, the breeding trio out, popped them in another tank and let them spawn in there, then move them to another tank and let them spawn in that rather than catching the fry out. The brevis, they're not a very hard Tanganyikan cichlid to breed uh, or to keep and they're very easy to catch if you've got shells because they just go into the shells to hide. So I can easily catch the breeding trio, it's the fry that I always struggle with. Great little shell dweller from Lake Tanganyika. If you're looking at breeding something that's a little different from your uh, Neolamprologus multifasciatus, the most common shell dwelling cichlid out there. Uh, you want something a little different, that's still an interesting fish to watch their behaviour. Give the Brevis Sunspot a try. They've got a beautiful uh, yellow gold coloration on the belly of the females. They're not an aggressive fish, they are aggressive to the fry. They want to get them away from the, the shell where the new babies are, uh, are, are, are hatching. But apart from that, they're a pretty peaceful fish. Um, and again, you can breed them in a harem like I am here, one male and two females. Um, if I had more females, I could breed them with this male and they'd, and they'd happily uh, breed together. But um, this is more than enough uh, supply for me for brevis in, um, in my fish room. So again, you can see the, the resemblance the brevis have to the Couriurus, but the brevis don't grow anywhere as large as the Couriurus. These brevis are maybe three times as old as the Couriurus, and the Couriurus are already double the size of these brevis. So there's the big difference with those with the, between those two species of fish and the other thing is the fork tails the more elegant looking tails with the Couriurus beautiful fish there's also a pair of bristlenose in this aquarium I'm able to keep some bristlenose in this tank uh, to keep the algae at bay uh, and help me clean the tank anyway guys on to the next aquarium okay this is not the most clean tank you've ever seen this has a lot of algae in it and I'm not really proud of it but I'm showing you it anyway this one has some um, old java moss growing in it uh, there were strands left when I got rid of all my guppies um, and I just put those, those strands in here and they started to grow in this aquarium. Now these guys are my breeding pair of Gelidochromus regani. 
And you can see they've got some frying here. They're doing quite well. The Regani love to pick at the algae in this aquarium. I did have one bristlenose catfish in here to try and help me uh, with the battle of algae on this tank. And because I have Java moss growing in here, I like to keep the light on to try and help that Java moss grow because I would like to grow it again. It's not doing too well again, but uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm not really a plant guy, but I had a bristlenose catfish in here and it wasn't doing too well because the Regani were just too aggressive with it. This breeding pair, they go through their ups and downs. The bond between Julianopramus Regani isn't exactly a strong one. Like I said earlier, the females are the dominant fish of the pair. They will bash males, even males that are larger than them. Um, they can kill the male and that's what my other pair did the female killed the male so that's why she's in that four foot community aquarium opposite to this stand this pair have their ups and downs sometimes they spawn sometimes they're angry at each other and the males hiding up in the corners and then sometimes they're spawning again i'm not having really good success with this pair in here and um, i might move them on i'm not sure but i love regani they're a beautiful fish them and uh, transcriptus gombi are my favorite of all the jitterchromis genus i've been breeding them for a number of years i had two breeding pairs I want to try other fish, so that's why I might move them on, but we'll see. On to the next tank. So these tanks house my bristlenose catfish, and I'm showing you two at a time here, because it's kind of the same thing. Uh, but on the right here, we've got some peppermint bristlenose. We've got five adult peppermint bristlenose in this aquarium, and uh, there's an Indian almond leaf at the front here, with some driftwood and some terracotta pots. Like I said earlier, I don't really like the look of the terracotta pots. But these guys love them, they love their caves, they like their little hidey holes, so that's in there for them. And uh, this tank, yeah, all these, all these bristlenose catfish tanks are run on double-headed sponge filters. Uh, some of them have power heads in them, and that's to help me clean the feces off the bottom of the tank so I don't have to vacuum it out every week when I do my water changes. All I'll have to do when I do the water changes is suck the water out and then clean the power filter, clean the internal power filter uh, because that captures all the feces during the week. Uh, makes cleaning these tanks very easy, especially when there's fry in the aquarium um, and you're trying to scoot around all the fry to get all the feces out of the tank. Um, it's, it's a very painful process and it's very easy to suck up the fry when you're doing that. So pop in a weak internal power filter, say 400 litres per hour, 500 litres an hour. That's more than enough for a two foot long aquarium. And that will just scoop up the feces throughout the week, make your life a whole lot easier when you're trying to breed these guys in mass numbers. Now, like I said, in this aquarium here, um, there's some five peppermint bristlenose catfish, some adults, and I'm trying to breed them. And that's why there's an Indian almond leaf in there. And I have spawned them. Um, they had some eggs about a month ago, and uh, pretty much on New Year's Day, there was a clutch of eggs that got kicked out of a cave. And I tried to raise them myself, and they all got fungicized, and it was a horrible mess. Just put those eggs in an egg tumbler, pop in some baby bristlenose in with the eggs and in the hope that those baby bristlenose will try and um, eat the fungicized eggs first uh, to keep them clean because I've done that in the parks with um, some success and it didn't work the fungus kept growing so I popped in the clutch of eggs back into the aquarium hoping the adults will clean it and uh, the eggs just disappeared so I can only assume the adults ate the eggs uh, but that was the first first time that the peppermint bristlenose had spawned uh, so I learned a bit from that and they spawned within a week, maybe two weeks of putting in that Indian almond leaf. Now, I didn't put an Indian almond leaf in for a few weeks, this is an experiment just to see if it was the Indian almond leaf that triggered their spawn. And uh, this one has been in the tank for uh, a number of weeks now and I do believe they've spawned again because the male at this cave over here is fanning the eggs. So that's a good sign, there might be some eggs in there. I, don't want to really put a torch down into the cave and stress him out uh, too much because he might kick that clutch out. I do believe that was the male that kicked the first clutch out because the eggs were around here um, at the front of the tank. And so he might be on another clutch of eggs and hopefully he's learning again, learning how to be a good dad and learning how to care for that clutch and raising those fry. Hopefully that's what's happening. He doesn't normally fan his fins like that. Uh, so. When they fan their fins the way he's fanning them right now, they normally have a clutch of eggs and they're moving water through the cave. So uh, that's a good sign he might be on a clutch of eggs. In this tank on the left, a more bristlenose catfish. But uh, the interesting thing with these bristlenose catfish, uh, they're all common colored, so the black colored bristlenose catfish, but the long fin variety. Uh, the, the adults are, the breeding, the breeding adults in this tank are all the one color, the black variety, all long fin. However, the interesting thing with this tank is 
that they produce four different types of bristlenose catfish. Uh, they produce, obviously, long fin black colored bristlenose. They also produce long fin albino bristlenose. Then they produce the short fin varieties of both those colors as well. So short fin albino and short fin black. So four different types of bristlenose from the one type of fish. Pretty interesting to see that. Uh, they've got a mix of genetics. It's pretty good to have because I'm getting a, different, a lot of different fish from the same type of from, from the one type of fish. The long fin bristlenose are sought after, especially the albino ones. Anyway, guys, there's two bristlenose catfish tanks. And these next two tanks are bristlenose catfish tanks as well. The tank on the right here has short fin bristlenose, uh, both the albino and common colored bristlenose, and uh, they do not possess the long fin gene. So they only ever produce short fin bristlenose, but both the albino and common bristlenose in that tank. There is a lot in that aquarium. Um, and then in this tank, they are the albino long fin variety. They are all albino long fins. I bred all the bristlenose you see in here, all the adults, and they are from common colored bristlenose. So they are from the black bristlenose you saw before, the long fin variety. These are from them. And I spawned them in that aquarium and now I selected them to go into here and I'm trying to breed long fin albino bristlenose, line breeding long fin albino bristlenose. And they have been spawning for me. Now, I've had some mild success, I would say. Uh, there were a load of fry in here that were approaching uh, a 1.5 centimeter mark. And then they all suddenly died. I don't know why. Um, I've been popping baby brine shrimp in here, uh, zucchini, boiled zucchini, and uh, catfish pellets as well, as well as cichlid pellets that sink. Uh, just give them a range of foods. And um, yeah, they were doing really well. I was just doing my usual thing. And um, unfortunately, they uh, died all of a sudden. And they were doing well. Like I said, they were doing really well. But then all of a sudden, they all just died. So I don't know what happened there. Maybe it was a water change that triggered it. I'm not sure. But uh, that was their first batch of fry. They've still got some fry in here, just not the numbers that I had a few days ago, which is unfortunate, because I really was keen to show you guys how well these, these catfish were doing. Uh, but I really want to line breed these um, beautiful long fin albino bristlenose. Uh, all the babies they've had so far, I could tell they, obviously, I could tell that they're all albino. Uh, they haven't had any normal colored bristlenose uh, yet, even though their parents were the normal colored bristlenose. Um, and I suspect that they were all long fin as well. Uh, but we'll see how they go. They've only been in here for about one and a half months. Um, and yeah, producing fry already. There are some fry in here that um, have their yolk sacs still attached to them. So they're constantly pumping out the fry, which is great to see. And I've got a total of seven adults in here from uh, my count when I first put them in here. Um, I can't remember what the ratio was, males to females, but there's obviously a mix because they're spawning. There you go guys, it's every tank in the fish room. So there you have it guys, the full fish room tour for 2023. Now some of you are probably wondering what's been going on, where have I been? And to be honest with you guys, I just wanted to take a break from YouTube and social media as a whole. At the start of the year, I actually caught COVID and that was the first time I ever caught it. And it knocked me out for about a month and I was in no mood for making YouTube videos, that's for sure. And that kind of snowballed into March and now pretty much April. Uh, I want to apologize for that. I should have probably made a little video about stating what's been going on, but I just wasn't in the mood. I just want to take a break from YouTube and there's nothing wrong with that. So um, I apologize for all the messages that I haven't replied to yet. Uh, I've got a lot of messages on YouTube and Instagram as well as to my personal email address. I haven't had enough time to get to them. And this year has been so busy for me. It has been nuts. I haven't even been able to go to my cichlid club uh, since November and um, it's now March and I won't be able to go to the April uh, auction either and that's the major auction. Uh, just been so busy and I might not even be able to go to the May one and that's six months since I've been to a cichlid club. I've just been that busy this year and time has flown by so quickly it's just been nuts. But anyway, here's the first video of the year and it's a long one and I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll wrap this video up now. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.